Stanford University. Well, thank you, um, and let me, let me add my, my welcome back as well. It's great to be here. I'm glad to see so many people here in spite of the fact that there's a football game going on. Um, so long before there was football, uh, the nations of the world were engaged in their own game of territorial acquisition with violence. Uh, and um, so that's, uh, I want to talk to you about some of, the, some of the product of that process today. So as Trish mentioned, my, my research has, deals with uh, uh, the origins and consequences of territorial conflict. Uh, and as part of that research, one of the projects that I've done recently is to, is to put together a digital map that contains precise locations of where there have been conflicts over territory between states, and this is in the post-1945 period. So this is my baby over the last several years has been identifying these regions uh, that have been the subject of, of, of disputes and, and sometimes war between states in this period. And in the process of putting together this map, I, I feel like I've virtually walked, not literally, but virtually walked um, many of the world's borders and learned stories about where they came from. And so what I thought I'd do today is to talk a little bit about some of my favorite stories, about some of the oddities uh, that, that, that history has produced for us. So, we so I hope you'll learn some stories that are fun and interesting. At the same time, I, I want to give you a sense of some of the different forces and considerations that have shaped the world's borders. Uh, and I also want to give you a sense, in some of these cases, how, how these oddities, which can often be very funny, have very real implications for the lives of the people who have to live with them. Uh, as we'll see as I talk, we're going to learn, we're going we're to see important influences of war and conquest, uh, of colonialism, uh, of geography, and of demography, the distribution of people. We're also going to see a very important role uh, played by one of those very potent human forces, that of ignorance, uh, which has played an undue role in the formation of borders. Uh, so with, uh, on that note, I want to start uh, in Africa, and we could spend most of the day in Africa, um, but I want to start with one particular oddity in particular uh, that is known as the Caprivi Strip. So this is this little portion uh, of uh, Namibia which sticks out like a finger over here. All right. So the Caprivi Strip is named after the German Chancellor Leo von Caprivi. Uh, and it is a product of the late 19th century colonialism in Africa. I'm going to switch back and forth here. Uh, this map here shows you how the European countries uh, divided up the continent of Africa in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, Germany was relatively late into the game of colonialism, and so it was kind of squeezing its colonies in, in between uh, those of other powers. And so Namibia, what became Namibia right here was squeezed in between the uh, Portuguese possessions in Angola uh, and the Br British possessions of what would become Botswana, South Africa, and the like. Now, Caprivi wanted this strip of land here, and in 1890 signed a treaty with Britain where they gave some territory to, to the British in exchange for this strip of land. And the reason that he wanted it was because you'll see this blue stripe here is the Zambezi River, which runs over to here. Caprivi was hoping that by touching Namibia to the river, it would give, it would give uh, access to the east coast of Africa, and to German possessions on the east coast. So this was a way of, of, of creating communication by water uh, between the different German colonial holdings. There was only one problem with this, which is that it turns out the Zambezi River is not navigable. Okay? <laughs> it has very severe rapids, and in fact, not that far downstream of, uh, of the Caprivi Strip is <laughs> Victoria Falls. <laughs> All right. So Caprivi's plan to connect uh, Namibia with uh, Tanzania in the east uh, was, came to naught, but we still today live with this little strip of land. And it's a funny story, but it's got a serious side to it, which is that uh, the people in the Caprivi Strip are ethnically and linguistically much more similar to the people in the surrounding areas of Botswana uh, and what's now Zambia than they are to the people in the rest of Namibia. And because of its kind of strange shape, it was very difficult for Namibian authorities to govern that area. So it's been a site of conflict. In the 1990s, it was the site of a separatist movement, the Caprivi Liberation Front, which was seeking to detach it 
uh, and attach it to uh, more ethnically similar areas nearby. So this is a small example of a much larger phenomenon in, in Africa that arose in this process, whereby the boundaries often cut across uh, different ethnic groups because they were, they were drawn with the interests of the colonizers in mind, not with the interests of the people uh, on the ground. Now, the Caprivi strip uh, points like a finger towards the next oddity that I want to tell you about, which is the border that may not exist that I mentioned in the teaser uh, to this talk. And we're just going to just move over a little bit to the tip of this strip here, to this place where four countries come together uh, right, right around here. And I'll, to help you out, I will, um, I will gonna switch to my slide here, show you what's going on. So this is a place where four countries, uh, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, and Zambia all come together. Uh, and, and the issue that I want to talk about is whether or not Botswana and Zambia actually have a border. Now this is the way it's drawn on Google Earth, and this, is the, this reflects American US government policy on this. This line here that, that separates Botswana and Zimbabwe follows an old road that's no longer there. This line is supposed to follow the median channel of the Zambezi River. This line follows the median channel of the Chobe River, and then they're supposed to connect. And you see, if you draw it this way, then there's about a 150 meter long border uh, between Botswana and Zambia. But the problem is, is that the medians of these rivers is actually not trivial to determine. These are broad, low, uh, low rivers. Their, their, their uh, height changes quite considerably over the course of the season. So exactly where the median is can be unclear. Exactly how you should extend the channel of the Chobe into the Zambezi is unclear. And so others have argued that it actually looks like this. That if you extend the, this line to here, it actually cuts off this border and Botswana and Zambia don't share a border. And then the other possibility is that if the, all the stars align properly, they all meet together in a single point, which would give us something unique among independent states in the world, which is a quadra point, a point where four countries meet together. Now, this may seem trivial. It matters because back in the 1970s, Botswana wanted to create a ferry to Zambia. And the question arose as to whether that ferry passed through their own territory or whether it had to cross Namibian or Zimbabwean territory along the way. All right, and in, at the time in the 1970s when Zimbabwe was Rhodesia with a white minority government and Namibia was controlled by South Africa with a white minority government, the relations were not great and this became an issue. Uh, today, they're trying to build a bridge uh, across the Zambezi. And the question arises, it'll almost certainly cut across some of Zimbabwe's water here, but we don't know how much. Everybody right now seems to be happy to live with the kind of this fiction here, or at least this understanding, which gives them a border and what lets this bridge get built. Now, my own view on this uh, is that they ought to renegotiate this border and actually make it a quadra point. Then they could uh, follow the example of another famous place in the world uh, where four, four, four states meet. Uh, they could turn it into a tourist destination, um, although I do think it would be difficult to do downward facing dog on a quadra point that's in the middle of a river, but I'm sure they could figure that out. Okay, so that's the border that may not exist. All right, let me show you, let me go to my next, next case I want to highlight for you. Let me make this red disappear. I want to take you to the border between Iraq and Saudi Arabia. Hopefully, hopefully that's not too nausea-inducing. There we go, the, this border here that separates Saudi Arabia and, and Iraq. And at first glance, this does not look like a strange border. It, uh, it's not particularly strange. Uh, it's composed of a series of, of straight line segments, uh, which is quite common of borders in this area to be, to, to be drawn along straight lines, right? And so if we kind of, um, if I can just zoom out here, you'll see We've got straight lines separating Saudi Arabia and these other countries here. You have lots of straight lines running through um, the Saharan Desert over here on these North African countries. Now, we sometimes think of straight line boundaries as kind of the epitome of colonial ignorance and arrogance, right? That some, some bureaucrat in London or in Paris had no idea who was there or what was there and just decided to draw 
a straight line uh, through the territory. Uh, and in fact, there's an, an apocryphal story uh, that the shape of um, this little hook in Jordan right here was due to Winston Churchill hiccuping as he was drawing a straight line uh, through, this, through this area. Now, I want to say that you know, there's absolutely the case that the process by which primarily the British drew these lines in the Middle East had a malicious hand to it. Uh, the British kind of double-crossed the Arabs after World War I when the Arabs who had joined them in World War I had hoped for a unified Arab state, and the British and the French conspired to carve it up into individual states. And so there's certainly much to blame there. Um, but the issue of the straight lines um, may not be as bad as it seems. The straight lines that they drew were often not a product of ignorance, but a product of the, of, of the nature of where they were drawing these lines through. Um, they mostly go through desert areas, uh, where there are very few people live, and where there aren't pronounced natural features like rivers or mountain ranges that you could have used instead. Uh, to draw these straight lines. In some ways, it was responding to the necessity of drawing lines in a desert area. And that's what brings me back to my, my, my Saudi Arabia-Iraq example, because I want to tell you that that straight line border there was not drawn by the British. It was negotiated between Saudi Arabia and Iraq as independent countries in the 1970s. And in fact, we can compare it to the line I just made appear. This was the line that the British drew which actually had more kinks in it in this diamond-shaped neutral zone, which they couldn't figure out what to do with. So when Saudi Arabia and Iraq got together to draw their boundary, they straightened out the British line. Okay? And in fact, the same is true of all the other Saudi boundaries as well. The boundary with Jordan that you can see there, and these other boundaries down south, most, many of which are composed of straight lines, because Saudi Arabia was not colonized. It actually negotiated these boundaries. All right. Now, the one thing that this boundary drawing in this area, the one group of people who were really affected by it, were nomadic people who live in this area. All right? Desert nomads who would often have to range far and wide in order to find grazing areas for their cattle and to find watering holes. And the process of coming in and drawing European-style boundaries in these deserts could often impact them quite a bit, because now traveling back and forth between their ancestral grazing lands could, could require crossing an international boundary. And if the countries weren't particularly friendly, uh, this could be problematic. So I want to show you my next case. The next oddity was an example arose be precisely because they were trying to solve this problem. And this is going to take us to the border between Egypt and Sudan right here, which you can already see from Google Earth is a bit of a mess. Now, this border was in the news recently. You may have seen the news about this. It's been covered extensively in the Washington Post in particular. So it turns out there's a, a seven-year-old girl in Virginia uh, who apparently, like many seven-year-old girls, I don't know, I only have sons, but ma many seven-year-old girls dream of being a princess. And so her father did what any devoted dad would do. He got on the internet and he found a place of land that no country claims which is this little trapezoid right here. And he planted a flag, <laughs> declared himself king, so that his daughter could be princess. <laughs> OK. So what's going on here? So and how is it that there's a piece of land between Egypt and Sudan uh, that no country claims? Uh, and is there really a, a place like this that's up for grabs by, by this guy here? Well, let me, let me tell you the story of what happened here. Um, so again, we go back to colonial times when, in the late 19th century, uh, both Egypt and what would become Sudan fell under British colonial rule. The British controlled both, and as they commonly do, they just decided to draw a straight line uh, at the 22nd parallel between them. Uh, so you get this straight line border. There's a little notch here where it follows where the Nile comes in. I'm not going to focus on that. So they created this straight line border. But then they realized that, that the straight line had created a problem for some of the nomadic tribes in the area. And in particular, there were some tribes down in here who often traveled up into this section of Egypt as part of their yearly migration for watering holes and grazing. And there were some other e tribes up here in Egypt that would routinely come down to watering holes in this area here. And they decided that for administrative reasons, it made sense 
that the, that the lands that these tribes would migrate through would all fall under the administration of either one or the other so that they wouldn't have to cross an international border. So this, is, this line was drawn in 1899, and in 1902, they drew a second line that is a, an administrative boundary. This created two areas. This area here, known as the Halaib Triangle, is an area, though technically Egyptian, would be administered by Sudan, so that these Sudanese tribes going back and forth would always fall under Sudanese administration. And similarly, this trapezoid here, known as Bir Tawil, was created so that certain tribes that were here could migrate in and always stay under Egyptian administration. And this was all, all fine until the 1950s when both of these countries became independent. And Sudan started organizing elections in this triangle here. And Egypt came and said, hey, wait a second, that's ours. And Sudan said, uh, no, it's ours. <laughs> All right, so the Egyptian position has been that the correct border between the two states was established in 1899 at the 22nd parallel, and that that gives them the right to the Halaib Triangle, and that Bir Tawil belongs to Sudan. Sudan says, no, for 50 years before independence, this was the pattern of administration. This is what we controlled. The real boundary is this boundary here in red, which means we get the Halaib Triangle, and Bir Tawil is yours. Okay, so it is technically true that neither state claims Bir Tawil. Each state believes that it belongs to the other one, <laughs> right? So, because what they really want is the Halib Triangle, which, as often is the case in these areas, is rumored to have minerals that might be valuable. So, it is in fact the case that the two, neither state claims this area. I do not think it's up for grabs, though. Right? Because by the, the history that I just told you, it either belongs to Egypt or to Sudan. We just haven't figured out which one yet. Okay, so now what I've talked about so far um, are some cases of really fuzzy borders. Fuzzy because there's, there's these rivers that it's unclear exactly how they meet, or cases where we had to draw straight lines because there aren't very clear natural features that you could have used instead. Other pairs of states may have the benefit of ha being separated by a very significant natural barrier, like a big mountain range or a large body of water. Um, and so it, in those cases, it can be very convenient for the boundary to follow the boundaries that nature gave you. Right? So Switzerland, for example, sits very comfortably inside the little fortress created by the Alps. What I want to show you now are two cases where states even though they had very clear physical barriers between them, still could not manage to get their boundaries to follow those, those barriers. So the first case I want to show you is going to take us to our own hemisphere. We're going to go over to South America and look at the border between Chile uh, and Argentina. Now you'd think drawing a border between Chile and Argentina would be relatively straightforward because there is this massive mountain range right there known as the Andes. Uh, and in fact, if you look at their border, I'm going to kind of zoom in here. Hopefully this will be relatively clear. Up here in the north, you can see as you kind of trace down that the, the, the border does actually follow the peaks of the Andes right along the ridge. You can see kind of a snow-capped mountain right there. The border's right there. It's following along this mountain range here. And you can go down for quite a ways and just see how it follows the snow line. But then weird things, once you get to a certain point, weird things start to happen. So here's the snow-capped mountains. Here's the border. Uh, you follow it a little more, yeah, somewhere here. Let me find it. Uh, somewhere up here, you cut through a lake. Where's my lake? I can't find my lake. <laughs> It cuts through a lake, it, does, it meanders around, the, the, there we are, well, we're going around these lakes here. We're, the snow caps are over here. Um, eventually, it, it just becomes a mess down at the bottom. So how is it that they couldn't manage with this big mountain range between them to get their border to follow it? Oh wait, here we go, here's my lake. I just had to keep going further south. Yeah, it cuts through the lake, <laughs> right? Snow capped mountains, border way out here. All right, so how does this happen? So the, 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 the struggle between Argentina and Chile 
uh, also had its roots in colonialism. Uh, in this case, it owed to the fact that um, most of the boundaries of the former Spanish colonies in South America were, were former Spanish provinces. Uh, but the Spaniards never really made it down into the southern tip here known as, of an area known as Patagonia. Uh, from the perspective of the Chileans and the Argentinians, this, this was terra nullis, land that belonged to nobody. Um, of course, terra nullis usually means land that belonged to no European descendant, because there were indigenous people there, but they didn't really count. All right, so, the, so Chile and Argentina for decades struggled over who would get Patagonia. And the main reason they cared about who would get Patagonia uh, was because, well, for millennia, uh, seabirds had been pooping along the islands and the seashore there, creating this very valuable resource known as guano. Right? And so you can see in these pictures here, you know, just huge mounds of guano being mined being turned into fertilizer or gunpowder. And so they wanted, both, st both states wanted to lay claim to Patagonia for its guano wealth. Uh, and that's why they struggled over it. And then in the 1880s, Chile got into a war with some of its other neighbors and decided it needed to settle with Argentina, the boundary dispute. And so they signed an agreement in 1881, which by all rights should have solved the problem. It says that the limit between Chile and Argentina is going to follow the Cordillera of the Andes, that is the, the ridge of the Andes. The frontier line shall follow the highest peaks of the Andes, which divide the waters, and will pass between the sources of rivers and streams on either side. Sounds straightforward. So don't notice that this the agreement here has two different principles about how the border is going to be created. The highest peaks of the Andes, and the division of the waters. And just to be clear about what the distinction here is, so we can imagine my little mountain range here with their high peaks. So one way you could draw a border is by just making a line that connects the highest peaks. OK? Straightforward. There's another principle known as the division of the waters, or a watershed, or a continental divide. And here what you do is you look at all the streams and rivers that empty out to the Pacific Ocean, all the streams and rivers that empty out to the Atlantic Ocean, and you draw the line that divides them so that all the, all the water on one side drains to the Pacific, and all the water on the other side drains to the Atlantic. That's the division of the waters, and we're all familiar with a very prominent division of the waters in this country, right? the continental divide in the United States that follows primarily the Rocky Mountains, where anything, anything to the west, if it drains to an ocean, it drains to the Pacific, and anything to the east, if it drains to an ocean, goes to the Gulf or the Atlantic. All right, and so when they said the highest peaks which divide the waters, they had in their minds perhaps a relatively straightforward view that if mountains rose up, the water that came on one side would fall to the east, the water that fell on the other side would fall to the west, and that the, there would be one border, one and the same. The highest peaks would also divide the waters. But it turns out that water doesn't always listen to your mountains. Okay? We know that water cuts through mountains when it's a river, we know that glaciers can cut through mountains. And in fact, that's what happened in the Andes in some of these southern areas. So what you find is that the line of the highest peaks does not, in fact, divide the waters in certain places. There are lakes that are on the eastern side of the Andes that nonetheless drain to the Pacific Ocean. So what that meant is that the line that divides the highest peaks and the line of the waters are different lines. And that's what led to a dispute. And this may be hard to see, but this is showing you a map here. So Argentina claimed that, it was, that the rightful line was the line that divides the, the line of the highest peaks, because that's further to the west, gives them the most territory. Chile claimed that it was the line that divides the waters, because that's further to the east and gives them the most territory. And they squabbled over it for 20 years until finally they went to the king of England and asked him to arbitrate for them <laughs> to solve this problem. And the English cared about this in part because they had all sorts of investors who wanted to build railroads, they wanted to do mines, they didn't want Chile and Argentina squabbling over this. The King of England was happy to solve the problem. And so he then drew, drew a line that's, that's here that's kind of neither the Chilean line nor the Argentinian line. So you had one principle, the highest peaks, which was a natural boundary. You have another possible principle, the division of the waters, which is a natural boundary. They end up with a border that follows neither, because it had to be a compromise to solve this problem. Okay. 
Now let me show you another example of states that seem to have no, should seem to have no problem separating themselves from one another and yet manage to do so anyway. I'm going to take you to Spain and Morocco. Okay, two countries separated by a body of water, a pretty significant body of water, right? The Mediterranean, we've got the Atlantic over here, we've got the Strait of Gibraltar. It should be really easy to get your border to line up with that big old body of water. But it turns out that it's not that easy. And there are two small enclaves of Spain in Morocco. I will take you there. They are Sueta, which is right there, Ceuta, sorry, and Melilla, which is right there. Tiny little enclaves of Spain. Now, they go way, way back. These are, these are possessions that the Spanish have had uh, going back to the 15th century. They've held on to these ports and fortresses there. Uh, and they have, were subject to repeated attempts by Moroccans to, to seize them and to oust the Spanish. And in fact, uh, the history of conflict over, over this enclave in particular had a profound impact on the border that was eventually drawn around it. So in 1859, after a period of conflict, they came to a peace treaty where they decided that what they would do is that Spain would keep the fortress that it had and the area around it. And the way they were going to determine the border was they put a cannon on the walls of the fortress, a cannon of a specific size, angled at a specific angle, and they fired that cannon and measured where the cannonball landed. And it was 2,900 meters away from the fortress. And so then they proceeded to trace a boundary that was at all points 2,900 meters away from the Spanish fortress. All right, so we have the outlines of the 19th century Spanish fortress in this border here. All right, the idea was is that they would draw it so that the fortress would be just outside of the range of a cannon fired from Moroccan territory. Well, that didn't stop the fighting. You'd think, well, this would only work until the Moroccans get a better cannon. Um, the, the Moroccans never did get a better cannon. And eventually, the whole, all of Morocco fell under Spanish uh, colonialism in the 20th century. Uh, when, they, when Morocco was decolonized, Spain held on to these enclaves. And uh, this has been a source of a dispute between them, because Morocco says that these are vestiges of colonialism and need to be given back. Spain says is that they've held this territory since long before there were colonies, and that, they're, that, they, that they've held them so long that they are rightfully Spanish. This, this case has also been in the news lately um, because, there, as you know, there's been a great deal of migration from Africa into Europe, people trying to jump on boats and get to Italy and get to other places. Well, it turns out that in, in a European enclave right in northern Africa is going to be a magnet for that kind of migration. The, Malia is about, the average income in Malia is about 15 times higher than it is in the surrounding areas. And so in 2004, um, Morocco, uh, sorry, Spain built a fence around it in order to keep migrants out. And just the other day, this photo appeared, uh, this kind of classic photo. These are migrants trying to scale this fence, right, is where these guys are playing golf. Right? And so this is a big issue right now. The Spain ins wants to hold on to this, but they are now dealing with a very severe immigration crisis caused by the fact that they are sitting right next to uh, this area that's considerably poorer than they are. Okay. I just have a couple more. I've saved the strangest for last. I want to now take you to, I think, the strangest by far. But it's not the one I'm going to end on because it's too depressing to end on. I'm going to take you to the border between India and Bangladesh. OK. Um, so India does a strange thing. India has this little arm here that kind of reaches out. It's a narrow thing. And then it has another little piece of India over here. And so it totally surrounds Bangladesh. And that's weird enough. But I want to take you to something even weirder. Whoops. Which is this weird collection. <laughs> of enclaves, and you can't even see, you can't get a full picture of what's going on here, so I'm trying to render it here for you. So what's going on in this little area here, 
So if we imagine this purple line here, this is the boundary, the kind of the main boundary between India and Bangladesh at this point. And then in green are enclaves that are technically Indian, but they are inside Bangladeshi territory. And in red, you'll see enclaves that are Bangladeshi inside Indian territory. And if your eyes are good enough, they are not deceiving you. Right there is a little spot of green. That's a piece of India inside a piece of Bangladesh, inside India. <laughs> OK. Well, where did this come from? OK, so this come, we trace this back. This is a pre-colonial thing. This is not the British. It's not their fault. This goes back to the time when this area, the, the kingdom of Koch Bihar up here, uh, and this was at uh, Rangpur, which was then part of the Mughal Empire. The apocryphal story is that the rulers of these two places used to play chess, and they would bet villages as part of their game. And so that this represents the winnings of different villages in a chess game. I don't think that's the right story. The truth seems to be that this was a product of a messy end to a messy series of wars, which led to a very unclear distribution of control in this area that eventually solidified. And when India and then Pakistan partitioned in 1947, after having gotten independence, the, the areas that had been part of Koch Bihar uh, went to India. The parts of Rangur, Rangnur, Rangpur went to Bangladesh, or Pakistan at the time. And so this was preserved. Now, this is funny, but it's also serious. Uh, life in these enclaves is not great. <laughs> okay? uh, this is already a poor area. Um, but, they, but they don't have much in the way of social services, public goods, roads, electricity. Right? Who's going to provide it? They, um, they have very poor police protection. Right? So if you're Indian and you come under uh, attack from local villagers in Bangladesh, where are the, where are the police going to come from to help you because you're not connected to the mainland? Simple acts like trying to move back and forth can be very difficult because it involves crossing an international border. And it's a border where the countries haven't always been friendly. Okay, so life for these people in these enclaves is, is actually is, is, is harmed by this oddity. Now, there's a natural solution to this, which is to get rid of them, right? Just, just say this is the boundary, and everything on the Indian side is now India, and everything on the Bangladeshi side is now Bangladesh. And in fact, that's been tried several times, going back to the 1970s, to rationalize these things, get rid of them. And then it was recently as 2011, they signed an agreement to get rid of these enclaves. The problem has been that while Bangladesh would be happy to do this, uh, people, there, there are groups in India who are not. Now, part of this is symbolism. There's about 17,000 acres of Indian land here that they would give away. Only about 7,000 acres of Bangladeshi land up here. So to Indi from India's perspective, it would be a net loss of about 10,000 acres. What's more, the constitution of India defines the territory. Therefore, it's not enough to sign a treaty to change the borders. You actually have to have a constitutional amendment to make it happen. And so nationalist groups in India have opposed the principle of giving away Indian territory, particularly losing Indian territory. And it's bottled this up for, for decades. Right, so this is a case where you have people who are valuing the land at the expense of the people who live there and their welfare. As I say, that's a depressing story, so I want to end uh, my talk on a slightly more upbeat version. So there's another interesting enclave complex that sits on the border between Belgium and the Netherlands. Okay, so here we are. Here's Belgium. Here's the Netherlands. And there's the mess we're going to zoom into. So we can go in a little closer. Yep, zoom right into there. This is this this is a this is a, a Belgian town known as uh, Barl Hertog. It is inter inter uh, sected with a with a, a Dutch town called Barl Nassau. As you can see, this is primarily a Belgian, but there's also counter enclaves in here too. So this is a piece of Netherlands inside Belgium, inside the Netherlands. Um, what's Curious about this one is that if we go in even further, you will see that the border actually cuts through buildings and houses. <laughs> All right. So how do we get this? This is, this is a vestige of a feudal period where these lands were held by various dukes and lords. Right? And 
Uh, you could imagine that you know you're a duke. You have your you have your estate over here and an estate over there and a country home over there, and they're not contiguous with one another. And then eventually, when Bel Belgium and the Netherlands split, uh, the the lands belonging to this duke went to Belgium. The land belonging to the other lord went to the Netherlands, and you end up like this. It would be like if California seceded from the rest of the United States. But everything that Californians owned in the rest of the United States became California. And anything owned by people outside of California in California remained in the United States. So you get this patchwork that appeared. Now, the story here is not as depressing. Um, and in fact, um, if anything, uh, they do great in this area. Um, there are some minor inconveniences. I, I, I read that um, there was an issue because uh, Dutch restaurants would have to close earlier than Belgian restaurants that if you were split by the border, p patrons would just move their tables over to the Belgian <laughs> side uh, at closing hour. But the, but, the, but the thing that makes this work, the thing that makes this not a problem the way it is in India and Bangladesh, is that Belgium and the Netherlands are highly integrated countries. They started their process of integration long before the rest of Europe did. Freedom of pure, total freedom of movement across these borders, total freedom of uh, movement of goods, labor, all these things. So, it doesn't really matter that your house is split by a border or that the house across the street is in a different country because the barriers don't matter that much. And that's the point that I want to end on, the more hopeful, optimistic note. You know, so strange borders, as we've seen, can be a source of hardship and they can be a source of conflict. The way you can live with strange borders is by rendering them irrelevant. All right? That is by peaceful relations and integration among countries so that walking across the international boundary is just as trivial as walking across the street. So I'll end there and leave time to take your questions. I'm happy to answer questions about this or about other borders that might interest you, with the caveat that I don't claim to know the story behind every border in the world. <laughs> Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.